Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Petropolis Podcast. I have two very interesting guests today, Dr. Sherry Trusheim. I should have asked you how to say it. You so. nailed it, Trusheim. I, I suck, Sherry. <laughs> We're going to call her Dr. Sherry and Adam Schwartz. I know how to say that because I've watched all your YouTube videos about the cooperative way, the founder of the cooperative way, and Dr. Sherry is the founder of Urban Animal. Hello, you two. Veterinary co-op, what's going on? Why are we here today? Sherry, enlighten me a little bit. We are here today because you so graciously invited me, and I am happy to talk about (laughs) what we're doing at Urban Animal and the idea of worker cooperatives in veterinary medicine with anyone who will listen. So here I am. Veterinary cooperative medicine. Private equity is taking over healthcare. Yeah, it's pretty much already done it in human healthcare, right? And it is doing its best to do the exact same thing in veterinary medicine. Private equity claims that they can bring um, lower costs to pet pet care, better pet services, better care for the veterinary team. Mm -hmm. Is that real? I mean, I'd be fascinated to know how they're doing that. And I haven't seen evidence of that as of yet, as we've gone from maybe 5% owned by private equity and corporations to, you know, probably over 25%. And that's just general practitioners, never mind referral veterinary medicine that is predominantly owned by private equity and corporate. So we're not seeing that, I don't think. That's not what I'm hearing from the trenches. And and I think to do that at the same time, to, to elevate veterinary professionals keep pet care affordable and take a slice off the top to send to shareholders. I'm not quite sure how that math will work. And, and I don't think that's what we're seeing as veterinary professionals. And if you talk to pet owners, I don't think you're hearing about costs of pet care going down. Right. I mean, it's, it's pretty intense out there right now. It is. And you can't get an appointment. Good luck getting an appointment with a specialist. Yeah. 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 You've had your practice, three successful practices in the Seattle area since 2012. In November, launched the veterinary cooperative. Yes, we formed what's called an LCA or a limited cooperative association. It's only been a legal entity since 2019 in the state of Washington, where we reside. All our practices are in Seattle currently, but we have plans to expand our worker cooperative and our company throughout um, the U.S. Limited Cooperative Association is a legal entity, and it will be essentially the the house or the shelter where the worker cooperative lives. So we're starting with a, I'm 100% owner of Urban Animal as it stands now. I'm gifting a percentage of the company to the worker cooperative. And then over time, at a fair price, that is, I like to consider it sort of a family deal, right? That the worker cooperative can afford to purchase the company over time. It will be 100% worker owned when I die. And I think the important distinction is we're hearing more about ESOPs in veterinary medicine, which is great. I would never poo poo an ESOP and sharing your profits with the people that do the work is a great idea. But what is important to me about a worker cooperative is it involves governance. How do we deliver care? How do we do our jobs? I think that should be determined by us. I think that should be determined by veterinary professionals who have dedicated our lives to helping dogs and cats and not by folks who wake up every day with the mission to make money. And that's okay to wake up every day. But I think there's going to be a real, with that mission, but there's going to be a real disconnect between people who dedicate their lives to caring for dogs and cats and private equity. I, I just don't see how the connection gets made successfully. Why did you choose to become a vet? I, it's just all I ever wanted. I, I just, I still to this day make a little sucky face when I pet a dog or a cat or my recent horse that I just finally like achieved my lifelong dream. And that's just an energy or a connection that just makes me feel whole. I don't know how better to explain it, honestly. It's just in me. And I didn't want to own a veterinary practice because it's 
it's hard. It's, it's, it's a, it's a hard job. It's a hard balance. And I, but I'm an entrepreneur and I tried to do everything else. If I'm being totally honest, I became a veterinarian. Then I went full-time to carpentry school where I worked nights and weekends. I went to bartending school. I took the LSAT. I took the real estate course. I just wanted to do a business. I wanted to run a business. I wanted to build something, but I didn't want to build it in vet med because it just seemed daunting, but turns out that's what I do. And that's where I'll get a loan to start a business. And, and I just decided to do it my way. And now after I've done it for more than a decade, I want to leave my profession better than I found it. And to me, that is to try to do something to shift the control of veterinary medicine back into the hands of the people that that's what we do. And that's what we're, many of us are born to do. And I think we can do that. I really do. And I think worker cooperatives are an amazing solution to the problems that we face. Adam, what's a worker cooperative? <laughs> Tell me how. Uh, it works. Yeah. So it is, it is, it is a business that is uh, both owned and controlled. Uh, by the workers. So whereas in ESOP, you might have employee ownership, but in many ESOPs, you don't have employee control. So, so here in the worker co-op, and that is a critical difference. So what we're working uh, with, uh, with Sherry and her team on is, is, is building those muscles because no one gets taught about, about co-ops in, in school, from grade school to graduate school. It's, it's one of my lines in, in my seminars. I ask, how many people learned about co-ops? And it's a Ferris Bueller moment. Uh, anyone, anyone, and, and no one raises their hand. All right. So if no one's going to learn about this business model uh, in a formal academic sense, then we need to to teach it in in the workplace and so uh and uh, it, it is it is it's a it's a heavy lift there's there's no doubt about it but if if we think about the things that we're most proud of in our life it's the heavy lifts right uh what are, you know it's the things that we have to work hard for uh to achieve that that really give fulfill our sense of, of purpose and, and mission and so what we continue to see uh is uh, worker rights being eroded by by large large companies because it's it's just a numbers game you know wh one of the questions i ask is is why do for profit businesses get started you know it's kind of like buried who's buried in grants too all right they get started because they want to make money and i get it and i understand that and if you ask why a co-op gets started, uh, it's to serve their members. And in this case, the members are the owners, the workers at the at the business. In other types of co-ops, you know, there are credit unions and housing co-ops, food co-ops, electric co-ops. The, the the members are the consumers of the product. There are there are producer co-ops, uh, businesses like Organic Valley, Cabot Cheese, uh, Sunkiss, Sunmade, where the farmers came together uh, and and uh, formed co-ops. And then there are purchasing co-ops where small businesses have come together to form co-ops. Uh, uh, companies like uh, Ace Hardware would be an example. So this co-op business model exists throughout our economy. Uh, uh, most people are touched on a daily basis by a co-op. They just don't know it. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is, is bring that this that business model uh, into the workplace so that people can have a real sense of workplace uh, democracy. I was talking to a friend of mine who owns a pretty big corporation. And I told him I, I was having this conversation with you guys today. And I said, do you know what a, what a cooperative business is? He said, yeah, it's unionized. Well, he probably didn't learn about it in MBA school. That's he for had sure. no clue. And <laughs> this morning he called. He's like, I looked it up. It's not that. <laughs> and I <laughs> said, no. And he went on to talk about Cabot, Cabot mm -hmm. cheese. <laughs> People don't know. It's true. Mm -hmm. What about in the veterinary community? How do you bring that kind of process into the veterinary community? Because you're dealing with doctors, emotions, a lot of debt to be paid. And then you have patient care, cost of services. My vet bills have gone up forty percent in the last two years. Mm -hmm. So, how do you address these things? Well, I mean, I, I think, like I said again, it, it's like if we're going to take a chunk off the top and send it to shareholders, that's certainly not helping, right? Like, it needs to stay within the people doing the work, and and I think 
we don't have enough veterinary professionals. I don't really care what the AVMA is saying that there is not a shortage. I have, you know, three practices right now that we're trying to staff. We have approximately 17, 18 veterinarians. We could use 25, right? Uh, it People are leaving the industry and there are a lot of reasons for that. And this is probably not a long enough conversation to get into those, but I would love to talk about it. But, you know, we are losing veterinary professionals. And I think one of the reasons we are losing them is they are becoming disenchanted, disenfranchised by private equity and corporate America. And if we could give them a shelter to practice under where they're not asked to sell wellness plans. Don't get me started. Wellness plans were not designed by veterinary professionals, not anybody practicing or not anyone significantly connected and wanting to support the human animal bond. That's not how you do it. The human animal bond is in the crosshairs of the folks. It is a target to make money, period, the end. And that is not the case we all need to make money. We are, as veterinarians, severely burdened with student loan debt. We should all make a livable wage. We should be able to pay our loans and buy a house, right? But no one is looking to be a millionaire or get rich when they go into veterinary medicine. Not most of us, right? And and I'm an entrepreneur, and so I'm a little outside of the, the box. But for the, for the majority of veterinary professionals, we just want to practice our trade and our gift and be a part of supporting a healthy human animal bond. And that, in my opinion, if we were allowed to do that, we'd have probably a longer career lifespan than we currently do that. I don't know the current data, but it's, it's daunting. You go to school for eight years. I think the actual career lifespan of a veterinarian is shorter than that. Don't quote me, but it's, it is, it's grotesque what's happening. I don't know a nicer way to say it. And, and we are, I would always tell clients, we're about 20, 30 years behind human medicine, typically, right? Like, you know, MRIs are now a common thing in, in veterinary medicine. That didn't used to be, you know, we kind of follow behind and, and we're doing it on the financial side as well now. And, and I personally think the human healthcare in this country, that system is one of the most broken systems in the modern world. And if we think following it makes any sense for dogs and cats, like that's our job is to help dogs and cats and increasing the cost, losing veterinary professionals. These are not ways to help dogs and cats. Identifying them as a way to make a profit is not going to get us there. It's going to get us to higher euthanasia rates. That's where it's going to get us. We're already there. Yeah. yeah, already there. The shelters are full. People are returning their animals because they can't afford the can't afford it. Just minor issues they can't afford. Yeah. So then people wonder why the shelters are full and the USDA doesn't do anything about the puppy mills either. But that's a whole other story we can talk about. Yeah. It's lack of management, right? Um, Adam, maybe we should talk about how we can set up a co-op that gets rid of the puppy mills <laughs> and it brings together the better breeders. Anyway. No, gonna, um, well, there, I, I believe that there is a co-op solution for everything. So that is my bias. All right. I, I, love I that may connect you with somebody who is looking to do that. Um, okay. <laughs> so are you, are you saying that this process that you're doing, that the new cooperative way of running veterinary medicine is that going to be more affordable for pet owners? Is that going to be the better path for veterinarians? Tell me how that's going to work and sure. why. You know, I would say we're already doing it at Urban Animals. Two of our three locations are a walk-in model with, you know, my passion early on was to keep veterinary care affordable. And I still have that passion. But now my passion is extending a little bit into you know, the realm of trying to build something different for veterinary professionals. But our goal at Urban Animal is to be the community's veterinarian. So we do nonprofit work with an amazing nonprofit, uh, but we staff it and help those who really have nothing but their pet, right? They're homeless or they are unhoused, excuse me. They, you know, they maybe have nothing but that bond. And those people should be able to have a pet. They should be able to, everyone should be able to experience the connection 
with an animal. And that is controversial, right? It's like, well, a pet is a luxury. Well, when we're not euthanizing any of them, I'll get on board with that, right? Yeah. Like the human animal bond should be available for everyone to experience. And that includes folks who have a minimum wage job. If you have a minimum wage job, you should be able to have a cat. And that is not the current state of veterinary medicine. So to answer your question at Urban, we are, you know, doing a much more affordable model in the city of Seattle than the majority of veterinary practices. We have over 50,000 clients and many of them seek us out because we are an option-based practice. We try to really meet people where they are to help them with the means that they have. In other words, we do not believe just saying, well, this is gold standard care and that's all we can do for you here. We don't, we can't do anything else. And it's like, sometimes you have to meet people where they are, right? And as long as they love their pet, they eliminate suffering and they do everything they can to care for it. That's all we can ask, right? So I think working hard toward affordability versus we run at a lower profit margin. We just do, and we do it conscientiously. Whereas corporate wants to hit 20%, let's say. It's like, well, do we have to do that? Is that what's required for growth and to keep our people with upward mobility? I don't think so. I think that's what's required to service shareholders. And, and if you eliminate those folks and the sort of overinflated, you know, corporatization of things, I, I think you can help keep care affordable. And I think if you stop meddling and telling veterinary professionals how to practice, in other words, profit centers, if I ever had someone walk into my practices and say, as a, say a distributor or salesperson, you should have this in your practice. It's a good profit center. I would tell, I'd show them the door because don't come in here and tell me how to take care of dogs and cats. That's my job. That's what I do. And I do it for what's best for the owner and the pet, right? I don't do it because it's a profit center. And that way of thinking has no place in medicine, in my opinion. We've lost the battle for human, but we haven't lost the battle for veterinary medicine. It doesn't have to be like that. We can do something different. What percentage of veterinarians are owned by private equity at this time? Private equity, my, my CFO, Joe Corey, who is an amazing, he's a recovering banker. He could probably answer that question, but I'm going to speculate that it's somewhere around when you speak of general practices, it's somewhere around 25 to 30% and growing every day. Right now, they're, it's a sleeping giant, right? Interest rates are high. Money is expensive right now. So they're taking a break, right? They're not doing a ton of purchasing. So I'm like, now is our time. <laughs> now is our time. Let's let's rally. Let's gather. This is the moment where they've sort of settled down, but they're going to go right back at it as soon as interest rates go back down. Adam, are there any other? I mean, you're not the only one, are you? Uh, there's there's one other uh, California, uh, right? uh, 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 Wisconsin in Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Uh, okay. a veterinary uh, worker owned veterinary uh, uh, co-op, and the the dream is and, and Sherry, I would add to, to to your answer, you know, you're you're doing well, uh, you know, by the pet by the pet owner and with this model uh, with the workers as well, so that they're they're going to be making a livable wage. And what what I would would say to you, Taz, and to, and to your listeners is that. When you're dealing with 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 people that own the business, right, there's there's a different level of care that that comes than if you're dealing with someone who's working for a, a major, you know, uh, for profit uh, private equity uh, uh, firm. Because when you own something, you treat it differently. And if people doubt me on that, if you've ever rented a car, you probably don't treat your rent a car <laughs> the same way you treat your car, right? And so um, by by transferring that that ownership and that's the sense of commitment that, that comes with it. And I'm a small business owner as well. I'm also part of a shared services uh, uh, co-op. So my my business, the Cooperative Way, is, is part of a group called Columinate. So I'm in a co-op of 50 other consultants that that do similar work uh, that that I do, uh, and there's 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 just a, a better feeling. This there's the 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 sense of camaraderie, the sense of that we're working for something that that creates this virtuous circle. Right? We're we're helping our clients, and that's helping us, uh, and it helps our clients more. So it it really is taking us uh, and moving the economy and the society in in the world that I want to live in. Uh, 
You know, there's, there's the game that I'm sure everyone has played as a kid called Monopoly. Well, well, how do you win that game? Okay. Oh, I get it. You own all the property and bankrupt everyone else. Well, well, sign me up. When do I get to live in that community? All right. Well, there's actually another game. It's called Coopoly, and it's this is truly a game by the the Tessa Work Collective out of Massachusetts. And there's only one game piece. And the way you win is if you successfully form a co-op or not, where with you know you play with three to eight people, right? And that's the kind of of society that I want to live in, where we're working together for the benefit uh, of of people, and not this this cutthroat competition uh, where the the one with the biggest pile of cash wins, because that's really not what wins. As individuals, we know that. Uh, we need to make a decent living and worker co-ops are all about that. We want to make sure that the workers are paid a fair wage, uh, but that also there's a, a, a satisfaction, a sense of happiness and purpose that comes with our work. Because that's what, really what I think what people want. The mom and pop veterinary clinics are the ones selling to the private mm -hmm. equity. Mm -hmm. They just want to get out. They're exhausted. Yeah. They don't, ask, they don't want to do the grunt work anymore. Why would a co-op model take that grunt out of it? How does it take that grunt factor out of it where the mom and pops feel like they have a community? Yeah, yeah. You know, for for me, it's the idea of a slower sale over time. I do think practice founders and owners need to have that reward for, I mean, I can speak to the blood, sweat and tears and the life I gave to starting my company. And it is tiring and it is exhausting. But if we started thinking about an alternative exit strategy sooner, right? Like I, I could have sold out to private equity and be not working anymore. I mean, that's the reality. And But I'm choosing to stay in it and do some work that I'm passionate about. I don't see patients anymore. That's not what I do. I, I run the company and work on this, you know, with Adam and, and how do we build this and how do we grow it? You know, my goal as an entrepreneur, this is my new entrepreneurial sort of uh, exercise is how do we take this idea and grow it into something that goes all across the country? And that if you, as a veterinary professional, want an alternative to corporate or private equity groups, come work at Urban Animal. And there's a spot for everyone. And if we just keep growing, then everyone has upward mobility. And everyone who wants to be a member of a worker cooperative can be. And I think that's how we're approaching things a little bit differently at Urban is we really are, we're trying to scale this thing. And part of that feeds my entrepreneurial side. And it's like, I really want to put something cool into the world. And and we can do that. And and I'm raring to go. And and we're on the path. And I, I'm excited to where it's where we're going to go. I, you know, look for us in New York City, Tess. Oh, I was going to say anything I can do. My, maybe phone calls. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. We need to talk anything yeah. I can do seriously. Yeah. It's something no. that I look for. And and other practices, if they, you know, if they want to take the same approach, I would be their biggest advocate. And I would be happy to talk to anyone who says, you know, hey Sherry, I've got this practice and I'm I'm ready to be done. How can I do something similar to what Urban Animal is doing? You know, I bet the practice in Wisconsin would be willing. There are options. You know, I think for me, I've always been outside the box. I was thinking outside the box. It's just how I think I came out of the womb, right? It's just, I've, I've just, don't put me in a box. And, and I think that's what we've got to start doing as a profession is not just looking to what's right on the other side of the door and who's knocking, but what else could we do, right? And and I think it's time we have to stop believing, right? We have to stop believing what they're telling us. I have talked to enough people who are like, yeah, they said it would be this, that, and another thing. And it's not. And it's like, okay, we've seen it enough now. Like it, it won't be, it doesn't matter what they say. They'll say what they need to say to sell the dream, right? That's, I sell a dream too. It's just a different dream. <laughs> and, and I think the difference is Ours is real. I mean, if, if you read about Mondragon in Spain, I mean, that's in the Basque region of Spain. This has been done. It, yeah. We can grow the largest veterinary company in this country if we want to, right? Like 
if we decide that's the path we want to take as a profession, Mondragon, 80,000 workers competes globally. Like we can compete with Mars. We can compete with anyone. We just need the people, right? We need the people to decide they want something different. And to me, the people I speak of are veterinary professionals. What's it going to take or what are the barriers for you right now? People, honestly, like I, right now, I think I just sent an email yesterday to 17. I got my hands on a list of 1700 veterinarians in the state of Washington. So I started there and I just sent them an email about what we're doing. And today I didn't have 10 applications on my in my email box. So I was like disappointed <laughs> because I'm like swinging for the fences, right? It's like, I mean, I think we just have to start talking about it. So again, like you having me on and us starting to talk and Adam getting more opportunities for people in veterinary medicine to hear about this concept from someone who's dedicated their life to this idea, right? Of cooperatives. Like there is a different way. We just have to believe it and do it and make a move. So you join all forces together and you buy diagnostic equipment, you can get lower cost services, you can actually save money for the pet owner. Yeah. And the veterinarians have a quality of life. They're getting paid a living wage. Is that living wage Okay, let's think about the emotions and that connection with living wage, because yeah. there's a perception with living wage, yeah. right? What the government says, what we think, what we believe, what we've been raised with culturally. What does that mean for someone who has devoted their life and has paid a heavy price mm -hmm. in education and time? Mm -hmm. What does a living wage look like for a veterinarian that's new, for a veterinarian that's been around a while, and one that is kind of transitioning in life and career? The place we're, we're starting is we're trying to just meet. Like, we're trying to be, you can't make more money as a veterinarian working down the street. Now, some differences with us. We do not, Urban Animal doesn't pay a production-based salary. So I, most pet owners, I'm not sure they know, but the most veterinarians that you see and any veterinarian working for one of the major corporations is paid a percentage of the invoice, right? So so now you're you're having a conversation with your veterinarian about what's best for your dog and what diagnostics you can do. Well, uh, oh. and 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 listen, most veterinarians are not motivated by money. But at the end of the day, we've all got bills to pay. We have got to make that mortgage payment. And you're getting pressure for an increased average transaction. There is none of that at, at There's Urban. There's no upselling. You're not. No. And no. Okay. And no veterinarian wants to upsell. Like that is, again, we're like, most of us love medicine. I mean, that that's kind of got to be part of it. You start with a love of dogs and cats, but then, you know, it weeds out when you go through organic chemistry and physics and all of the classes, you know, some people are like, no, thank you to the medicine. I'm just going to own a bunch of dogs and cats. But, but it, you know, as a veterinarian, you have to have that love and that thirst for knowledge and, and medicine. You're not interested in selling things. You're not a salesperson. You're not selling wellness plans. You're not. So, so I think, how do you, so how do you meet everyone? I guess we start with Okay, we're not going to pay you based on what you produce. Everybody brings something to the table and the place runs because everyone has a different skill set, right? So already kind of a cooperative way of thinking about things. We don't reward the person that charges the most, right? We're we're trying to meet pet owners where they are and and provide option-based care. And the only way you can do that if you don't link your paycheck to it. Um and then I think, you know, your your reward should be somewhat should should be in line with what has your time commitment been? How much have you spent on your education? You know, did you become a licensed veterinary technician in two years? Did you do additional training? So now you've got even more advanced training and contribute more within the practice in a certain skill area. You know, for me, compensation rises with degree of investment, time, skill set. 
you know, and I think we're trying to do a good job of communicating with our people of like, well, what does that look like? What are our, what are our salary bands? How can you move from here to here? Like, how can you track your own upward mobility? And I think, you know, having some way to help people retire, that's going to be part of our work in the worker cooperative is like, how do we, you know, how do we get folks to a place where they can see an end game within the profession, right? That, that, that doesn't happen very often right now. No, I mean, it seems like it would be a driver for new vets, new physicians coming into the field to want to become better, mm-hmm. even better and being of service and learning and continuing to just keep growing. It, it's such an incentive that you don't think about it not existing in the regular, in, in, medicine, in veterinary medicine as a whole. But then when you have companies like Mars who own a big segment of the veterinary field and the diagnostics field, mm-hmm. um, you lose trust and faith. I mean, yeah. I can't tell you how many people complain about their veterinary visits and not getting results. Yeah. Is it because time is limited? Is it because they don't have the emotional wherewithal to really give to that pet owner? Is it a combination? So what you guys have created um, seems like there's hope, gives hope. Yeah. And what I, what, what I say to that is hope needs a strategy. Right? Yeah. Talk, talk and, to me. And, 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 for, and for me, co-ops are the strategy. Right. It gives it gives us uh, the the tools uh, to take what our hopes and dreams and visions are and to put them to work. And the business model in its in its modern formation has been around uh, since 1844, uh, when a bunch of folks in Rochdale, England, uh, created the uh, food co-op because they were being treated unfairly and forced to buy their goods from the company store. And they wanted a different way of doing business. And that's what we've created. And, and what I love is that it, I'm originally from New York City. So when I went to high school, you know, talk to friends, where do you live? Oh, I live at the co-op, right? Because that was the housing the housing co-op. Well, if I do a lot of work in, in, in rural parts of this country uh, as well, and where people are served uh, by an electric co-op or they're a member of, of a farm co-op, right? And so the, the business model is incredibly versatile. Um, you get to create you know, uh, Sherry and her team went through the, the process of writing their bylaws, which is sort of their internal constitution of how the business is, 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 going, is going to run. And then the workers are all going to have a role to play in shaping that to make sure it, it answers uh, what their needs and aspirations are as well. And, you know, when I was first started, you know, working with worker co-ops, it was explained to me, you know, this way, that the, the hurdle that we have to go over is that in this country, very few people really understand what democracy is, right? Because if we think about our families, we probably didn't grow up in a very democratic household. You know, I was told what time dinner was and supper, we called it, and what time we would be eating that supper and what would be on that plate. And I was, wasn't, was you know, we didn't get the vote on it, all right? And then you go to school and there's not a whole lot of democracy in school. Maybe there's a little sandbox of student government that you can play in, but the, the school structure is not democratic. And then you go to work. And there's not a democratic structure in work. It's a command and control. And yet we vote, maybe hopefully we vote and vote every two years or four years, but that's not democracy, right? What democracy means, you know, putting our fingers in the dough and, and creating it and doing it. And that's what worker co-ops do. And so not only are we training, you know, people to be uh, better workers and provide better care, you know, for, for, for animals in, in Sherry's case, but I think we're, we're open to create better citizens as well, uh, you know, that, that we're showcasing that this democracy can work uh, and will work and that it's not easy to do. But if, but if we have, you know, the right incentives uh, to do it, uh, it can be done and, and, and done very well. I have to ask a dumb question. I'm really good at dumb questions. <laughs> um, franchise co-op. I'm just thinking all the in the pet segment. Yeah. They're all these franchises. Sure. And how do I differentiate the two? Uh, well, I'll answer in the other. It just it, think of it in it as the flip of it. All right. All right. In in a franchise model, there's there's 
whoever the franchise owner is, right? And so McDonald's, right? And so every McDonald's is going to serve the same burgers the same way, right? And McDonald's tells the franchise owners what you're going to do and what, what products you're going to sell. In a, uh, in, in, in a purchasing co-op model uh, right? or in a co-op or in, in the worker co-op model, it's the workers who are deciding what's what's going to be done? Not the not the the, the umbrella. One, not yes, they're not not this one sole corporate corporate uh, owner. Uh, but I'll let your answer in the in in the pet industry, and then we can go into more detail on other industries if you want. So, <laughs> I you know we hear a lot about burnout in our industry. Yeah. In, in the the veterinary space is a is a challenging one to to work in day in and day out, and. And I think burnout comes from a lack of feeling of control or having any power over your situation. And I think what is happening to veterinary professionals is they don't have the control. They don't, their voice is not heard. And you can rename your veterinary corporation Thrive. You can do all those things, but those are just words. They don't actually mean anything. What we're willing to do as a company and think, makes sense for our industry is really give the people who do the work the voice. How should we deliver care? How should we, you know, it, everybody wants a raise. We might need to raise prices. Like where's this place where we think we can raise prices? Where can we do more? I mean, putting the reality is veterinary professionals want happy, healthy dogs and cats or whatever species they're serving, right? That's their primary goal. And so it puts that up with their job and they can sort of decide where they're willing to compromise and where they're not. Do you know what I mean? In, in both directions and not have that decision made for them. So, uh, you know, early on in, with my entrepreneurial spirit, I had folks talk to me about, oh, you should franchise. And I, that's just not of interest to me. I think we've got a great model. I think it'd be great if there were more of them, but but we're setting our sights on something much bigger than that. That's been done. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know, that doesn't seem overly challenging. This, what we're about to do is challenging. Well, it seems like with franchise, you kind of, you do what the umbrella owner, you know, the one holding the umbrella to stop the rain from falling on you. Um, but the in the co-op, you're talking about regional care. So if you have a lower income area, you're addressing the needs of that community. If you have an area that is a beach town, you're going to see certain disease states, certain problems. So your team is going to be very specialized in what's going on in that region. And you can feed off each other within the co-op mm -hmm. and work to grow and educate each other. There's so many factors that a franchise model couldn't give you that kind of thousands for it, but it's not going to work makes such sense community yeah essentially yeah, yeah. basically it's one of our seven principles uh concern for community <laughs> so yeah. yeah so it winds up being about the people you're serving you're serving yourself your purpose your why the mm -hmm. reason why you went into veterinary care all right how can i help <laughs> how can my listeners help right. that are you know yeah. owned by private equity I think I think one of the in, certainly in this space, you know, I I think listeners when they bring their their pets to their vet, ask the question, who owns this practice? Right? Let's let's just start with 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 that awareness, right? Uh, because I, I right the, the one of the things we did early on with my partner Jim Johnson on working with uh, on the, on this project is we visited uh, Sherry and her team and, and we spent a day at at the clinics. And it's a hectic place. There's no doubt about it. And you you attract people who have passion for what they're doing. I think you mentioned 17, 18, you know, DVMs, but then another 80 people who are not, right? All right. And they are working their tails off, right? All right. To, to, to meet their needs. And their, their passion and their commitment deserves to be rewarded. All right. And, uh, and I, I think, 
you know, the the customers, the clients of of, of veterinary clinics uh, to, deserve to to have the best practice possible. And and for me, I think the the worker co-op model, given what we're seeing with with what venture capital is doing, uh, gives us the best alternative uh, to provide the the best care uh, for the clients and the best outcome for the workers. Who owns this practice? What do I do with that information once I find out? Look for maybe a different practice, <laughs> <laughs> or or tell or 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 have them tell their vet, hey, you know, there's another way, right? Yeah, yeah. all right. I like that. <laughs> Actually, I just found out my vet, who I love, I absolutely love, and I torture. He was he was burned out, Jerry. Yeah, <laughs> he was burned out. And it was before the pandemic. And he did sell mm -hmm. to private equity. And then another private equity came in and bought out that other private equity's ac acquisitions. So mm -hmm. he went through three different private equities. Yeah, and, sounds about right. Yeah. And I, so with a co op, when you pull everything together, I presume, depending on the, caseloads and the neighborhood, you can really have the best of both worlds. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's the goal. Exactly. And I think it's an obtainable goal. Because you know the whole, you know, the whole basis of the for-profit model is that they're going to be making money. So there's going to be a percentage of money. All of that VC money, the venture capital money, it, it's all designed to get paid back and get paid back at astronomical rates, all right? You know, 20, 25% returns or more that they're looking for. Well, where's that money coming from? All right? it, there's only so much, you know, in the pie here. And so at some point, patient care is going to suffer. The amount of time that the, the, the docs are going to spend with the patient is going to be reduced. You know, all the things that you see, you're going to see quantity care, not quality care. You're going to see more tests ordered because that drives up the invoice and that's what they're there to do. So hmm. we've right, seen this, we've seen this rodeo before. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And the human health care. Right. Uh, Sherry, another dumb question. Teaching hospitals, what are they like? I mean, it's kind of messy, the teaching hospital in New York. Very I mean, messy. it's been been 25 years since I was a veterinary student, right? I graduated and I was fortunate enough to do an internship, uh, just additional training at Oradell there just across the, mm -hmm. yep. the bridge from you. Um, and not everyone can do that. There's only enough internships for about 10% of graduating veterinary students. And my partner at the time was a graduating veterinarian. So I saw firsthand what it was like for me going into an internship for additional training. Granted, you work 100 hours a week and you make no money, right? But you learn more versus she went into general practice as a new graduate. The reality is, unless things have dramatically changed in the last 25 years, which I do not suspect they have, when you become a new veterinarian, you barely know how to dose cephalexin. And by that, what I mean is you haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. You you haven't learned. You learn by repetition. You learn, you learn to become a good diagnostician by seeing things. And if you are not mentored well, it will be a hard road to becoming a what I call a sort of bomb-proof veterinarian. In other words, whatever comes through the door, you can formulate a plan with the owner that makes sense for that pet. And that is really hard for new grads. And I think at the to get to your question, the vet schools, I think kids are kids. The graduating veterinarians, I'm getting old, are so in debt. The system is broken from the foundation, right? I know, I know new grads who are $300,000 in debt from veterinary school. Yeah. Now, if the average wage is somewhere, let's just say 100 to $150,000 a year, those numbers do not add up well, right? Not, you're not, how, how are you gonna pay a mortgage on top of that? Your student loan payment is your mortgage. There's the house that you're not gonna get to buy because yeah. you chose to be a veterinarian. So something needs to change. But what I'm seeing happening in the veterinary schools is we're now suggesting practice ownership at a really early 
stage in our career. So we're saying we're preparing them to run businesses and we're saying, hey, you should open your own practice in three to five years because that's your path to financial security. That's not wrong, but I'm going to argue that I think you need to develop as a veterinarian for more than three years, because let me tell you, that learning curve of running your own business is pretty dang steep. And that's going to be where your focus is not. And some people are superhuman, right? I am not one. I can't become a better medical doctor and learn how to run a business all at the same time. That's pretty challenging. So what we need to create are spaces where new graduates from veterinary school can be mentored. They can have a livable wage, but they can be mentored over time to develop into that bomb-proof veterinarian. And those options are not great right now. You can get a huge signing bonus from a place like Banfield, but let me tell you, the likelihood of you learning a lot and having great mentorship, in my experience, in that setting, is not great. Is any kind of business ownership being taught in veterinary schools? And if it is, what's being taught? Is it how to start your own practice while you're learning to become a vet? You know, I, I always tell folks when I first opened Urban Animal, it's embarrassing to say, but I did not know what a profit and loss statement was. I just did not know business basics. I was surrounded by a great community of friends that helped me and I know when to ask for help. That's my skill set. And now we are teaching, you know, there are business development groups within veterinary schools that are trying to teach them the basics, which I think is great. I guess I just am struggling with the timeline of when you should start trying to implement those skills. And I think becoming a good veterinarian is first. But yeah, we're we're at least starting to try to teach folks some financial independence and maybe go your own way and open your own practice. The unfortunate thing I'm seeing is those dollar signs are pretty hard to resist. And I get it. But you can open your own practice and three years later, if you're successful, you can sell it to private equity, right? And that's a path I see some newer graduates taking. And and I, I just, I'm not passing judgment, but I think it's unfortunate for our profession. They're becoming veterinarians for a reason. Get the mentorship, learn those skills, become great at what you, you're doing. And, and go work for a worker cooperative. And exactly where I was. Then you have mentorship on the business side because you're seeing the big picture. And Adam, are you going to be educating any veterinary schools anytime soon? I mean, I, that, that would be that would be a, a wonderful uh, use of my time. In fact, so there, there's an analogy here. So uh, independent pharmacists. I, I don't know, you know. So these are our pharmacies that exist, you know, more often in rural areas where you know a CVS or a Walgreens is not going to uh, place. Well, there's a lack of 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 independent farm and they're retiring just the silver tsunami so there's a purchasing co-op and so this is a co-op made up of independent pharmacists so they they're buying you know all the things that those pharmacies need in in bulk so that the independent pharmacy can get similar pricing to what a cvs uh, is getting and so what they've done is they've taken the next step uh, i believe it's a colorado state uh, uh college where they now have a a, a course uh for independent pharmacists at the pharmacy school there uh, in running your own business, becoming an independent, ph- not going to work for, for Walmart or, or CBS, right. Right? right? And then they've, they've developed a, an investment group, not of VC folks, but of independent pharmacists who help that young pharmacists coming out of school invest in that business, get started, and then they've got a group of mentors, right, that are helping them uh, uh, run the business. So the, the independent pharmacists can retire, but still feel connected, right? This is a legacy business, right? It may have their name on it, right, uh, of serving, sorry. So I think there's no reason why we couldn't do the same thing in, in vet schools, right? And training people on what it means to be part of a worker co-op and how how they can, they can either attach themselves to an existing one or, you know, start the de novo ones. That's fine too. Absolutely. So I want to ask you about insurance, pet mm-hmm. insurance. How mm-hmm. does that affect your field in, and how does it affect what you're doing in the cooperative? Well, I, I can speak to it from a cu- couple different angles. I think as a veterinarian, it is easier to practice when your clients have pet insurance. There's no question. When, when that financial burden is lifted, from folks and they can just do whatever they need to do in that moment, it's a great relief to everyone in the room. 
Now, flip over to sort of the you know the the sherry that's starting a worker cooperative and and sees these problems in our industry. I think that is a perfect example of where we are following human medicine. And I do not see an end to that road that is good. I, in my opinion, insurance has never been the solution to anything. It does not solve problems. It creates problems. And I think it will create drastic problems in our in our industry. You know, they, we haven't gotten to the point where it's a big enough player yet but it will drive up the cost of veterinary care. There is no question. So my goals of keeping veterinary care affordable and that someone who has a minimum wage income can own a cat, those days will be done unless they can also afford insur an insurance premium, right? I, I just, I, I think if we focused more attention on giving cats and dogs and patients in general, the care that they need in that moment, the skills and the knowledge to live a healthy life. If we focused on those things, it would be a better place, right? Versus upselling things we don't need and getting protection in place to, you know, be able to afford the crazy expenses when they come. It's like, let's do more to hold down those expenses. Because again, who's who are the profiteers there? Who's benefiting from pet insurance? There are clearly profiteers in the insurance industry. And, and to me, that's that's not solving our problems. My biggest concern with that is eventually there's going to be some kind of connection. Bye, Adam. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Right. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Thank you. My problem with the insurance companies is they want to negotiate a lower price. When is that going to hit the veterinary market? When's it going to hit the big hospitals? You know, Mars is going to own the uh, the insurance. They're going to own the diagnostics. They're going to own the hospitals. So they're going to have, they're going to rob from Peter to pay Paul so they don't have to pay certain taxes. And in the end, the pet owner is the one who's going to be paying. Yes. So we are following that ugly path. And if, if we don't shift the way we're treating our pets medically yeah. and how we're treating our veterinarians, we're in for a rude awakening. It's going to cost too much to have any animals. And the industry is going to suffer as big as it is now. It will suffer. And and who else will suffer? Dogs and cats, animals, you yeah. know, and that like, yeah, I, I just, I do not believe that you should have to have great means to have a pet and to experience that human animal bond. I think if we move into that, universe. I don't want to live there. I don't. And, and, and I think, unfortunately, the more insurance becomes a player in veterinary medicine, the more amazing veterinary professionals we will lose. There is no, there's no question. It, 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 it is not the solution. I went to a talk at VMX, which I tell you what, I haven't been, do you know what VMX is? Yeah, it's a, yeah, of course. Yeah. you're like, yeah. of course I know what that is. Um, <laughs> I haven't been to a big conference like that in, cause I'm kind of beating my own drum. Right. I'm like, I don't, and I went in cause now I'm, you know, I got to start getting in there. I got to start talking to folks. And so I'm there, I'm telling you what, it was like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory up in there. And I'm like, Oh my God, we just started to look at the amount of money spent on those booths to have, you know, quarter of a million dollars, probably just to get in front of people to hand them a free plushie and people stood in line for those like you free know. plushies. Yeah, what the hell is wrong with people? You talk about sustainability and not buying junk. We're feeling uh, it was, you know, and we have a, we're having a booth at, at Western in Vegas in February. It's coming up and I'm talking about this and, um, you know, we got a little 10 by 10 space. Cause we're like, well, we don't have a space to talk to people about what we're doing. The expense was out of this world. Yeah, it was like two grand just for that little space and then yeah. you have to get furniture and then you have to get all the material. Yeah. I, I was just like, oh my gosh. We're, go we're going in and doing like guerrilla marketing. We are, we're wearing sort of provocative things that say things like neuter corporate. And, and then we are like just everywhere we go, we're leaving these little neon pink cards that say 
neuter corporate, ditch the leash, who owns your job, just all these sort of, and then trying to drive them to my talk. But, and, and, you know, my, my chief relations officer, who also happens to be my friend of 30 years, she's like, oh, okay. You know, we could get asked to leave or not be invited back. And I'm like, you know what? I'll take that press all day long because what is a little guy supposed to do? I don't have a hundred thousand dollars to like actually play the game. So we're right. going to play the game with the way we can. And we're going to make our way into the hearts and minds of veterinary professionals any way we can get there to hear, have our voice be heard. You need to be heard. And what, what about AHVMA, American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association? There are a lot of, there are a lot of little groups. They're, yeah. siloed. they're very siloed, right? Yeah. They're looking to have this, if you could put together a co-op of pure holistic mm -hmm. regions, yeah. Would that yeah. be awesome? I yeah. think there should be a worker cooperative space for every veterinary professional. Okay. Boarded surgeons, you know, internal medicine specialists, holistic care, acupuncturist, yeah. like all of it. You should be able to work under the umbrella of a worker cooperative, you know, or form your own or like, but you know, there's a, TVC, the veterinary cooperative. So purchasing group, right? We're, we're a member. I mean, what TVC can get certain drugs for, like it is, it's known that some of the big corporations are paying 40% less for the same drug, but it would take a hundred thousand dollars to hire a lawyer to like, because it's illegal what they're doing. But there's, there's, everyone's too small to actually fight it, right? And that's, that's probably the biggest concern. But I mean, I believe people are power, right? So we've just got to start. If people choose not to work for corporate and private equity, that's where we start. So I'm just looking to how do I get in front of veterinary professionals to say, hey, like we can do something different. Like we really can. We just have to do it. We have to choose to do it. Yeah. And and new up and coming vets, I think, will have a different perspective than people in their 40s and 50s yeah. who are stuck. Because that's yeah. a stuck that's stuck state for a lot of people. Yeah. Who's so stuck state? You know, yeah. unless they are shift the way they think, unless they're looking inward, unless right. they're getting out of that hamster wheel that, that they've created for themselves. You know, I gotta pay these bills, I gotta work in this environment. Um, so you have to find those little niche areas and grasp it and bring it to you so you can grow your numbers. It's going to take a little time, but yeah, but you are, I mean, you just converted to co-op just in November, right? Yeah. We just formed our LCA in November and the gift we were right before I got on this call, I was on a call about, um, the purchase and sale agreement of the gift that I'm putting into the co-op. And it's just like, even that is like the amount of no's I got and, and the amount of just speaking to a CPA, like, Hey, I want to gift 5% of the company to this worker cooperative that will form a seed. Right. And then as we grow the company, that seed grows. And pretty soon that seed can be the start of how they're able to buy the company from me yeah. over time and and just these convoluted synthetic equity all this different I'm like why are you making it well it's the best tax strategy and I'm like everybody's just you know the system is set up to make the most money and pay the least money that's how everyone is geared and and I, I don't want to pay taxes that I don't need to pay but I'm also like I think taxes are also there for a reason like why are we trying to avoid them <laughs> I think our profession has a lot of struggles and I, I don't know where we're headed. I'm, I'm worried that if we don't do something different, the profession that I went into and really sort of pushed back against for a long time, I was a third year veterinary student. And I started to think, whoa, this is going to be tricky. I was working in the the small animal hospital at the vet school and working at the front desk and starting to, and I had worked at a vet practice, but in more rural setting. And, 
And I was just sort of watching the human animal bond and thinking, Oof, this is going to be tough day in and day out. Like this is going to be a challenging space to work in. And I keep saying, I'm going to write a book on the human animal bond at some point, because I, I think it's not always moving in the healthiest direction. No. And, and it's scary to me what it means for us as a species. Honestly, it's like, I mean, I love my dogs like, and I make a sucky face when I pet them and I talk to them and I wave to them and I, you know, I humanize them in a way. I think over humanizing them is not good for anyone, Absolutely, especially not. them. Like they're not happy. And the, the way I saw dogs 25 years ago is not how they seem now. And so many of them are so anxious and so looking for a leader, not yep. somebody to dominate them, but well, a leader. Yeah. And, so, and I would tell my clients all the time, the happiest dogs I know are the dogs that know they're the dog. And they're happy being the dog because the dog's a great place to be, but they know they can't call 911. They can't get the groceries, right? They're like, I can't be in charge. How will I feed us? How will and I? They're not YouTube stars. Yeah. Yes. No, they're not yes. the superstars who wear outfits. And yeah, no, yes. we and created havoc. Yes. And there's just, and I'm, you know, I have a seven and a half year old son and I love him dearly. But I think it's super reasonable not to have children and have a pet instead, right? But you, it's not a true, it can be a substitute, but it can't be a, a human child. It has to be a dog child. And that needs to be different well, for everyone you, to be happy. You're giving up that respect that species deserves yes. by classifying them as your child i think yes. you are diminishing their value as a yes. species that is here to support right. us and we're here to support and help us be, be grounded be better right. people right right we're yeah missing that. we're yeah all up yes we really and are i was looking at your website before the interview so last night because that's how that's my that's my prep time and i was reading through and i saw the the term pet parent and what is interesting, and is I'd never really thought too much about pet parent until I went to VMX. And when I was at VMX, I heard everyone say pet parent. And that is a distinct difference to 20 years ago, right? Yeah. And and I don't, I, here's, what, here's what I tell other veterinary professionals. This is not in our best interest. Think about what we do. You're going to meet the new puppy and it's their, they're the parent, which makes the puppy the child. Yeah, And now you're going to euthanize that child. You're going to actually take its life. You are going to be the one that takes the life. And so a whole nother topic we could get on is the mental health within yeah. our profession. There's oh. the mental health people have when they come in, which I think people are drawn to work with dogs and cats because they have trauma often, right? Yeah. And so you get a subset at Urban. We try to have a very, you know, I have a bunion. You have clinical depression. You know, I have a torn knee. You have generalized anxiety. These are things we can just talk about. They're yeah. not, you know, yeah. mental health. We should talk about, right? I, and I, have a bunion. I really do have a bunion. I really do. It sucks. Um, but, but I just think as a profession to see us adopting that language is a little bit like us shooting ourselves in the foot. You have just taken our job to a whole nother emotional toll level. Whereas as a profession, we should be speaking more about not humanizing our dogs and cats. And how do you get a really happy dog? You don't humanize it, right? And that's what we care about is how do we have happy dogs and cats? Cats are a little different. They already think they're better than humans. So that would be like derogatory, you know, they'd be like, I'm a cat. Um, but I, I just think we're not talking about it. We're just going, okay, okay. Like, okay, that's the way it is. And it's like, as veterinarians, I think we should gain some control. We should have some influence over the human animal bond. Well, and I we're think not pet owners challenge veterinarians now more than ever because you have Dr. Google, right? And you have social media influencers who are veterinarians as well. 
and non-veterinarians who spew out a lot of things that are not relevant to the individual. It's like, I'm a franchise, right? I'm sorry. Yeah. It's that yeah. umbrella, right? They're, they are franchising their opinion and pushing it out to everybody. Yeah. So yeah, I think we've diminished the value of your profession. Mm -hmm. I think your profession has diminished that value. And the industry has truly screwed it up. Part of it is because of these investors coming in and wanting to make that quick dollar. Oh, wow, the pet industry is 200 some odd billion dollars. We should be in it now. How do we get into it? How do we develop the next food? How do we buy this home cooked brand and make it a veterinary brand? It's like throw it all the crap out yeah. there. And everyone wants to move fast. And as soon as they see something different, they demonize it. So yep. my worry for you is how are we going to demonize you? Oh, they're going to. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> you going out there and doing your guerrilla marketing, I think it's it's a great you know, kind of a, hey, yeah. later, we care about humanity. We yeah. care about animal welfare. Even if you don't, let's take the suck out of that. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. Um, shoot. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a lot and it. Uh, I don't know. I just keep, I just think it makes sense. And I, I think if we all, everyone who could do something did something, you know, and I think that's, yeah, I would love to sold urban and not work anymore, but then what would I be doing? Like, right. Like I want, a, I think we all want a purpose, right? We all yeah. want a legacy. Absolutely. I want to put something in the world that I'm really proud of. And yeah. I wouldn't be, it's not that hard to start a company, make it successful and sell it. That's my opinion. But what if you did something against the grain and built something that changed things for the better? And that's what I want to do.